Hi, I, I'm not sure I could hear everything you said, but your audio was very low. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Well, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Sorry. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so I'm 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 live now. I'm trying to share my screen. I can't seem to. Go ahead. Uh -huh. I can hear you clearly now. Um, but I, I can't seem to share my screen. So if you can hear me, I'm trying to share my screen. It's saying it's disabled. I'm sorry, Chuka, just give us a minute to enable. Um, you okay. All right. Abchuka, you can try now. Okay. Ah. Okay. Uh, it's shared, I think. All right. So let me let me know when we are live. We are live. We are live, Chuka. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, hello everybody. Uh okay. sorry. Yeah, I think I had an issue with my phone. All right, it's great to be here. Good afternoon. My name is Chuka Ofili, and as Toko already mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Interstellar Labs. I'm a certified cloud architect and I'm a Google developer expert. And I have been in the tech industry uh, in various roles for the past, say, 18 plus 20 years. So today, I, what am I, you know, what, what's the topic, right? It's essentially how to tra transition into a tech role. And what I want us to look at it from the perspective of have I been, you know, in it? Have I been a tech practitioner before? And I'm in a role that I don't want, or I don't enjoy, or I don't find so much passion in, and I want to transition into something else. So maybe you are, um, in, you know, uh, a regular web developer and you want to transition into machine learning, or are you a non-techie at all, you know, and you want to transition into, you know, a technical role? Are you someone who is maybe an architect or someone who is an estate surveyor? Or someone who is, you know, business administration or something that has nothing to do with technology, and you are looking to transition, or you're a newbie, you just started out in technology, or you just started out, you know, you just graduated, and you're trying to figure out what career path that you, you know, you take in life, and this seems interesting to you. So this topic, I believe, is for you. So let's start with, I think, the most obvious thing, and I think this has been flogged today over and over and over again. You know. We saw Funke Amoibi who spoke about um, how the future of work is technology and it's already here. It's not really the future, it's already here today. And I would like to say both statement, I think a lot of my peers, I, I would agree with this, that technology you know, is the new oil. With so many exciting perks, with the numerous you know, employment opportunities, the above average remuneration, you know, and as well as technology's significant contribution to humanity, it's no wonder, I mean, it's obvious, technology is new oil. As oil is to Nigeria back 
say 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I believe technology is today's modern air as oil. And not just for Nigeria, I think it's a global thing, right? Many have an eye for this industry, you know, and they're often discouraged by, you know, the high level of technicality and expertise that it feels like it requires. And again, because of the limited understanding of the tech industry, many individuals, you know, they see tech with this microscopic lens of like, you know, software as a service, you know, like as a consumer, you know, so you only consume maybe Facebook or you consume Instagram, but you've never really looked at it that, oh, it's possible for you actually to work in tech, even if, you know, um, you don't have any uh, technical uh, background. You know? And that would be the recurrent theme here, not just for people who have technology skills, but also for people who don't have any. Now, there are numerous fields in technology, right? So the most obvious one a lot of people know is software industry, which is software development, coding, program. But I think technology spans beyond that. You've got virtual reality, you've got artificial intelligence, you've got you know, um, cybersecurity, technology manufacturing, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, you know, data engineering, healthcare, technology for healthcare, you know, the blockchain, internet of things, and the list goes on and on. There's so many balls, as I like to call them, of in technology, or so many branches of technology that you could find yourself playing in, you know, without necessarily being the most technical engineer on the planet. Now, I've said this over and over and over again, right? You don't have to be technically inclined to work in tech. You don't have to be technically inclined to work in tech. You'll be shocked that there probably is a job available for you. Now, this presentation isn't only targeted to those who are uh, not technically inclined, but also to those who may be technically inclined, like I mentioned earlier, and want to transition into a different branch in technology so that you don't get stuck in one particular role. I mean, Obina today spoke, in his, you know, during his talk, was talking about how, you know, you shouldn't, you know, um, think of it this way. The role you find yourself in may never may, may not be the final role that you know would span the rest of your career. You can always change lanes and you can always switch lanes, right? And I mean a strong believer in that like, you could do more than one thing, right? So technology is what your eye, and not just because of the remuneration or not just because of the money, you know, because of the opportunity that affords a lot of other people. Now, according to Glassdoor's economic research, 43% uh, of available jobs in technology today are actually non-technical jobs, right? They're actually non-technical jobs. So people would then ask me, hey, Chika, what, what does that even mean, right? The truth is this, I tend to categorize, you know, tech roles into two, and you've been hearing some of it in, you know, in the thread of some of the things I've been saying. One is technical roles, which I'll talk about now, and then the second is non-technical roles. So for those who are interested in transitioning into technical roles, either from in, you know, a green perspective or from another technical role or from a non-technical role, depending on where you find yourself, maybe you are in, you know, as I mentioned, you are a banker or you are a fresh graduate or you're already an existing software engineer who wants to transition into another field. These are some of the interested, interesting technical roles that exist, right? They're a world of opportunities that exist here in technology in general, but I think I'll restrict, you know, restrict my scope to the software industry. So this list I'm showing, uh, this list that you're seeing on screen, is essentially you know, for the software industry. Remember, I said that there are many branches in technology, but this is just for the software industry. And you could pursue a career in any portfolio, you know, front-end development, back-end development, that's a typo, mobile development, DevOps engineering, full-stack engineer, software architect, data engineer, you know, machine learning, right? These are some of the popular, I'm sure you would say buzzwords that exist, you know? I mean, there are other parts of, you know, uh, technology that you could also, you know, transition into. But I feel like most of my thread and most of my conversation will target some of these goals, right? Um, Non-technical roles, yes. So you find yourself and you don't want to learn how to code. You're like, I'm not a coder. I don't want to do that, but I want to work in technology and I want to, Earn, afford the privilege of earning the same um, above average generation that some of the technology people earn, you know, like oil, oil, oil uh, 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 people used to do back in the day, right? If you're interested in tech as an industry, you don't want to be a tech professional. These are some of the opportunities that exist, all right? So uh, product management, you know, 
project management. Product management, what's product management, right? Product management is essentially out of making sure that a product gets built from scratch to finish. Yes, the engineers will execute it, but the product manager is the one who tends to envision what the product should look, feel, experience, and you know how the user will interact with it, what value should it provide the user. The engineers, on the other hand, are the one who will, you know, they are the ones who know the how, how to execute it and how to build it. So if you find out back in the day, the engineers used to be the both product manager, the project manager, and everything. But these days, in today's trend, you find that more and more there's the role carved out as product management. It's very, very popular now. As a three, four years ago, or maybe five years ago, it'll be hard for you to hear the word product manager, you know, in the context of a company. But given today's, you know, um, um, today's experience in building products and in building software tools and, you know, in technology, product management is probably one of the singular most important role, in my own opinion, in, today, in today's century, in 2020 or in the 21st century. And here's why. Users, people, back in the day, we used to build products from the back. But today, we build products from the front. And what do I mean from the front? From the customer experience. Who is the customer? The users, people like you and I. If I complain that I cannot do X, Y, Z on a product, it affects the you know, perception and the brand of that product. You know, word of mouth can easily spread. So therefore, this role is probably one of the most important roles in the non-technical role. Right. Um, project management, of course, I think very popular. Every field has project management. So does tech. The tech industry has project management roles. Now, truth is, some of the concepts, while the same across board, you know, how it's executed may be different from industry to industry. Customer success, another very important role. You know, the funny thing is, think of all the telecommunications companies and how they run call centers. A call center is essentially like, uh, uh, you know, a maxed out version of what a customer success unit for any technology company should look like. Take Paystar, for example. They have their own customer success units or their customer support units. The customer success unit is to make sure that the customer is successful at using their product. So if you're a developer who's integrating the Paystar, you know, merchant API, or you're a consumer trying to use your card on the Paystar pay payment portal, both of them, from a customer perspective, the customer support unit or the customer success unit is there to ensure that you're successful. The person who responds to you when you have a complaint is the customer success person. Now, quite all right, like I said, other industries do have this, but the only difference here is you need to have the main expertise knowledge about the product in question. You don't need to have technical knowledge, just domain expertise knowledge, which you can always learn once you get into you know, the use of those products, right? Sales and distribution. The sale and distribution of the product, products have to be sold. Product has to be distributed. How do you manage growth? How do you think of, you know, gaining more users? How do you think of onboarding more people on these set products, on these set tools, in this set ecosystem? These are human beings that do it. These are roles that exist. More often than not, the engineers form, what? 40% of the total HR capital in any company. The rest, and non-technical roles, research and development, operations, easily, easily roles that I think individuals can fill out without having any engineering background or any programming background. So in order to transition, there are a couple of tips that I would give. The first one is know your why. Don't just say you need to transition to tech because it's cool, fun, and trendy. No, you need to figure out I mean, and I think Obina already alluded to this in you know, the earlier keynotes. We need to figure out what, you know, why you want to do it. What is your motivating you know, factor? What is your, what is your what's, the, what's the key driving force? You know, it's not a question of you to just wake up and say, oh, I want to transition instead. There has to be reasons, things like alignment, right? Things of, does it, does it uh, so when I say alignment, does it align with your five-year goals, your 10-year goals, right? Um, is it a, is it a, you know is it money inclined? Is it because you want to have a better life and you want to achieve financial freedom, right? Is it in is it in alignment with that goal, right? Over the next five years, over the next ten years, what are your goals, dreams? What are your pursuits? What do you want to do? These are the things that would help you understand the reason 
why you should be seeking this career transition, especially if you're coming into tech. And that would help navigate, you know, how you would transition. The next thing, tip that I'll give into transition is know the what, all right? You should know the what. Okay, you seek to transition into tech, but again, tech is across many departments and many industries. The question here is what exactly do you really want to do, right? What do you really want to do? So in order for you to answer that question, you need to do what? Investigate. Okay, so you need to get information. You need to find it out. Not just because, you know, it will help you in guiding how you apply and how you look for opportunities and also how you prepare yourself for opportunities, but more importantly, to know if you will excel at it, if you will be happy doing it. Because it's not enough to just transition into a role that you don't know about and you're just about to start. If you don't like what you'll be doing on a day to day, then what's the point? Because passion is not, you know, coinciding or connecting, you know, with purpose or, you know, fulfillment, as, as we'd say. So once you've identified the field that, you know, you, you are interested in, you know, once you, you've known what exactly it is that you want to do, I think you will need to investigate it as much as you can, right? It's a new industry. The things you should look out for, what are the existing job roles that exist in that area? There are many portals that you can use to do this, all right? What are the job requirements? What are the qualifications? What are the certifications? What are the time demands? Okay, what are the time demands? It's not enough to transition into tech if, for example, you're working 24 hours a clock. I don't think there are jobs that do that anyway, but my point is investigate. The opportunities for growth, are they there? Do they exist? Are the salary, salary benefits accruable? Some companies offer equity, of course, and while some other companies offer better compensation, right? So it depends. What are you looking for? What's the career hierarchy and the pathway that you are going to identify with to know where you fit in, right? You need to know all of this before you enter the industry you are trying to transition into. Very, very important. Tip number four, envision and plan. So the, the envision that you've derived from your career investigation should be enough to help you, you know, think or envision, you know, this new career, all right? See yourself in that role. See yourself in that career with the required qualifications in your desired company. You don't have them yet, but picture it. You know, um, there's a friend of mine who um, picked up something uh bank only williams right and and of course this kind of story that you, you've heard and you've been told many times tim carrie has told the story before and he told himself that he saw himself being someone who would be uh, you know not just an orator a public speaker you know he, he saw himself in that role and you know he wrote himself a 10 million naira check and posted it on pinned it on his um uh you know the pin board in his bedroom you know and i used to go visit him and when i see uh, that check, you know, we tease or make, make fun and I'll say, yeah, Banky, Alpha, you don't pay yourself this check, you know, and we'll both laugh about it. But now today, of course, he surpassed that, paid himself that over 10 times over and he's doing much very well. But my point is he'd already started envisioning himself and he already planned towards it and he already pictured it and then he already started working towards it. So you need to know what you want. You need to, you know, know why you want it. Then start to understand the required qualifications that you need to be able to get to that position, right? There are many opportunities that are out there. And then finally, tip number five, commence the transition. You actually now start. So what's the, what, what, is, what, what, is, um, what does commencing look like, right? Just means take, start taking active steps. In the previous step, I said you need to envision and plan. So you write things down, okay, by a year to, you know, 2000 and this, I'm already have this, I already have this, I already have this. So, but now you actually now start taking active steps. If you're in an active job, then you need to manage your time. Hello? No question. No question. Okay, you need to, sorry, I got interrupted there. So you need to manage your time. You need to manage your time. You need to plan your time. You need to um, write things down and then start to make goals, start to set objectives and start to try and meet them, okay? So under the whole transition part, there are some key drivers or there are some key steps that you, you, know, you should take. Number one is learn. You need to learn more 
lack of skilling. Um, uh, 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 Ms. Amobi talked about this in her last uh, slide in, in her talk, in her keynote earlier today, which is you need to learn, you need to have skill, okay? Especially if you're coming from a green, you know, um, um, situation. Like, I think it's actually easier for you to learn when you don't know anything, like you're a newbie, you don't know anything, right? It's easier for you to learn than when you're already in one other role and you're trying to transition into another role or you are in a different industry and you're trying to transition you know, into one of the tech roles. But anyway, the important thing is you need to start learning and you need to start building the right relevant skills and you, on the job requirement rather that you've identified that you want to transition to. There are some great learning platforms that offer programs you, know, you can enroll in. I've listed some of them here. And I, I, I think I highlighted Udacity. Udacity is probably one that, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, to some people it's expensive, to some other people it's affordable, it all depends on your paying power. But the reason why I highlighted it is because they offer what we call a nano degree program that is recognized by a lot of the hiring institutions, even, even the big three, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, and so on and so forth. They recognize it because these programs are taught, they're instructor-led, they're taught by other people. Our good friend Chikawobi also has uh, an institute called Decacon that also can prepare you um, for, you know, learning. And, you know, the thing with upskilling is finding where you can get information, getting access to the internet, especially in the times that we find ourselves in, focus and assigning time to do it. That's how you learn. I, myself, I'm a self-taught developer, self-taught programmer. I was not classroom taught. I actually read about an original planning in school. But I've had a career in tech that spans 20 years because everything that I know today and everything I have achieved today and I'm able to do is because I was focused, dedicated, found information, took time and understood it. Now, I know my own learning path may have been different from other people, which is that, you know, um, people would ask me, Chuka, can you do X, Y, Z? My first answer is yes. Can you build a website? Yes. This was my, of course, donkey years ago. And I'll say yes. Can you do networking? Yes. But then when after I said yes, I would go to do research and figure out, get documentation, learn, pick up the job and execute, right? And it hasn't really failed me till now. But the important thing that I always did afterwards was immediately after I had, you know, picked up that job for the first time or executed for the first time, and, you know, gotten paid and been happy, I'd still go and formalize my education. So I'd either go find documentation or find books or pay for YouTube classes and videos, maybe not YouTube, but I mean, courses like, uh, you know, platforms like Udemy, etc. And you know, that's it. I would then formalize my knowledge. That's how I learned. Now you are in a privileged position where you can start learning on your own now, right? It's just adjusting your time. All these platforms, you know, if you want to become an infrastructure engineer or a DevOps engineer, Google Quick Labs is one of those fantastic resources that you can use. If you don't want to code, maybe DevOps is all that you want to do. You know, all these platforms help LinkedIn Learning, Khan Academy, Code Academy, Coursera, Udemy. That's the, they are all there. And some of them very affordable, as, as low as maybe $20 uh, a month or you know, $30 per course. It all depends on what it is you know, that you want to learn. The next thing I would say is certify. So now you've learned all this knowledge, right? And you know, this is the path and the process to transitioning. So my assumption here is um, you, know, you, are, you are green, you don't know anything, or you're in a different industry, right? Of course, if you're in the tech industry, the path may be slightly different for you, but certification doesn't hurt anybody. I do admit that it's not compulsory, but it will definitely help, especially if you're coming from a different industry, right? Certify, get some good global certifications that will make up for your lack of experience, especially if you are a new entry to the technology industry. Certifications help. Remember the first thing I said? I said there's a Google Certified Cloud Professional Architect. That certification, um, this is the second time running and you have to renew it every two years. There are different kinds of certifications out there. Look for the one that falls into the role that you are trying to transition to and see if you can get it. Back in the day, if you wanted to do project management, I think PMP was the easiest one that you could do. You know, there's Six Sigma. There's so many types of certification. Google, you find them. Next important point, and I don't think people usually talk on this point, connect. Connect. Actively follow companies you're interested in, right? Now, if it was pre-COVID, I would have said, always make sure you are at all those events that tech people always have. The cluster of events that are in, you know, tied to the role that you're looking for, you need to be involved. But now everything is digital. So look for all the digital conferences, all the webinars, and attend them. 
Connect with industry leaders on LinkedIn. Seek mentorship, seek guidance. LinkedIn is a fantastic place to start. Now remember, not all people will be able to respond, not all people will be able to give you the time of day, but it shouldn't stop you from moving forward. It shouldn't stop you from trying to seek, you know, um, connections and mentorship from people who can uh, help you. Um, prepare, okay? Prepare your resume, right? Start to put it together. Once you've done one certification, include it in your resume. Once you've picked up a new skill, include it in your resume. Once you've you know, done any small project, we do, you know, include it in your resume. And from time to time, you continue to tweak your resume. You continue to identify areas where you gained work experience that's closely related to the job functional, functional role that you're looking for and emphasize on them. You know, update your resume with industry relevant skills and certifications that you've added. You need to keep it going, keep, keep it going, keep it fresh. You know, um, uh, this is also another important point volunteer, right? Volunteer to serve in projects that are, you know, organized by companies in your proposed industry. It will give you visibility, it will improve your skills, it will help you gain more experience. And of course, it will just garnish your resume even more. Volunteer work is probably, I mean, volunteer on internship, right? If you find those opportunities, those are opportunities to learn because you learn by peer uh, programming, by peer, peer uh, learning and so on and so forth. That's probably one of the best ways, you know, to learn. Volunteer, right? People say, yeah, but you know, yeah, volunteer is free work. So you can't, you cannot pay enough for the experience that you're going to get. So if you find any opportunity, please take advantage of it. Then finally, apply. Apply. Apply for the jobs in the role that you want consistently. Learn from your rejection. You will get rejected. And it is okay. It's normal. It is fine, right? If you, if you the rejections will keep coming. And the truth is that, you know, it, it will keep coming until you land the first job. Whether it's remote, whether it's physical, but the point is you need to be consistent. And as you, um, 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 every time you get a rejection, I think the important thing to ask is, if possible, ask why you were not considered or why you, know, you didn't uh, get that role. It will help you in knowing what to learn and how to adjust yourself so that you can keep growing your competency, right? Even if the pay package is not what you're looking for and you've got an offer, take it. It might not be, um, um, I mean, it's probably already mentioned it. Take it. If, if it is in alignment, if it, if it, if it meets your goals, if it's, if it answers your why, if it's, if it, you know, if it's in the what category and you've done the investigation, then take it even if it's not the pain. Remember, even volunteer, you already volunteered, you got experience. And this is another opportunity to gain experience, right? To learn from the re rejections once you get your dream job. Then if you, if it's not your dream job and the offer comes, please take it so that you can learn and grow your competency. So famous words, I guess. <laughs> the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So make a plan and then take that step. Even if it is a baby step, you're working nine to five. You have, uh, uh, um, even if it's eight hours a day, you still have another five hours at least of downtime. Even if you take commute, well, we're not commuting anymore. So there's a lot more room and a lot more time. Even if you're doing one hour a day, dedicating one hour a day to this cause, look at yourself again in six months or in a year. I have been able to mentor and coach people who have transitioned from all kinds of roles, from physiotherapy, so I've some, I've mentored someone who's a doctor, someone who's an estate manager, someone who's an accountant, and they've all moved into technology, one way, shape, or form. Some into actual technical roles and some into non-technical roles. And they're earning far out, earning what they used to earn before, and they're feeling more fulfilled, and they're feeling better, and they're actually happy and what they're doing. So transitioning is a life-changing decision and you shouldn't rush into it. Give it time, but not too much time. Plan and then, you know, take the leap. Thank you. <laughs> so if there are any questions, um, I'll take them now. Thank you so much, Chita. Uh, it was really insightful. Um, right now, we don't have questions in the chat box, so maybe okay. it's an opportunity for those of us who still have to do so. Um, in the absence of any, none has dropped. Uh, none yet. Uh, thank you very much, Chuka. 
I'm sure people can reach out to you if they have any other questions or clarifications. Thank you, really appreciate it. But please, you can still drop your questions in the chat box and um, we'll definitely direct them to Chuka and get responses and share with you. Thank you, it's been a pleasure, Chuka. A pleasure. All right, thank you. Um, we'll be introducing our next speaker in just a minute. Okay. Hi, everyone. We'll be introducing the next speaker for today is Mr. Chika Ngobi. Mr. Chika is the founder of Decagon, which is producing a core of world-class Nigerian software engineers to help African and international organizations achieve their digital transformation goals. Before Decagon, Chika has been involved in incubating over 20 startups, including Baby Bliss Jobman, which is Nigeria's largest online job board, and Techie. Chika was the founder of MTech, where he launched Nigeria's first mobile internet service alongside MTN in 2001. And he also helped pioneer the mobile VAS industry. He has also led consulting engagements for Ford Foundation and IFC. He's a member of the board of Unilever Nigeria PLC and a venture capital in Rice Capital, venture partner in Rice Capital, which is a venture capital firm that's invested in Bokada, Prep Class, and Iroko. He's a member of the governing council of Anambra State Investment Promotion and Protection Agency, and he has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and a BSc in Computer Science. He's, he has an MSc in software engineering program at Oxford University. Please, can we put our virtual hands together as we invite Chuka? Please, you have. Okay, go ahead, Chuka. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, reading out my a full bio, not a whole story. Um, um, I, I, um, I'm also very involved with uh, the Covenant Nation. Um, uh, I'm very involved with the, um, helping to start the platform Young Professionals Bootcamp. I'm very, very um, privileged to um, start the same at KCN. And I learned a lot um, in my professional career. Honestly, I should be paying. Don't tell Pastor Ponjo this, but honestly, I should be paying <laughs> to be. <laughs> So, um, in and around the uh, leadership of what is really um, a really innovative organization, really innovative on the cutting edge of, of ministry globally from, I mean, in terms of the things that the church is doing. Any people know your members, so let's not. I also only have about um, 15 minutes. I have a hard stop at um, 12. But I listened to a lot of um, Chuka's uh, presentation. Chuka, it's like I only see you on seminars. I need Chuka, I need to see you, please. <laughs> please. Um, but um, majority of what I plan to say, he, he covered. So I will not, so therefore, maybe I'll spend about five minutes and then I can take questions. You, you heard my, um, bio so I can take questions from the perspective of I've been an employer in tech for 20 years in different types of companies um, so maybe I can take questions about about my topic is supposed to be how to be an MVP in tech an MVP through tech an MVP is a winner an MVP is somebody who everybody wants on their team an MVP is the most valuable player um, so I can share and answer some questions about the people that I have found to be MVPs, um, the people that I consider to be indispensable, people that I've promoted. I've, I've found, there's been a lot of people that have worked with me as coppers and I made and I ended up making them, promoting them all the way to be became, they became MD or CEOs of companies that I um, have invested in or that I run. So what did those people have? So I'll, I'm happy to take questions about that, um, but let me just, you know, dash through. Like I said, most of it you can cover already. So in the first place, you know, C.S. Lewis quote, um, you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. Um, most times I speak, I find a way to sneak in C.S. Lewis into, a C.S. Lewis quote into 
what I talk about. If you don't know C.S. Lewis, go and find C.S. Lewis and read his books, um, Mere Christianity, but also his children's books. Um, part of why C.S. Lewis is so important is because he's one of the most beautiful writers of English. Um, and um, he's one of the people that has, together with Chino Achebe, he's one of the people that has, that I really learned, I've really been studying on how to write. I mean, not now, I mean, like from when I was a kid. Um, but why that's important is because um, writing has become so, writing, writing is foundational. And majority of the people that I have looked at their series or read their written, their, their writing, written communication, um, their writing is poor. So this is a tangent, but in your training and in everything that you do about trying to become strong in tech, um, if you write well, by well, I mean strong grammar, strong communication, writing that people understand and are even delighted by what you write, um, you will be, you'll be an MVP. You will be set apart. The company will love you, clients will love you, colleagues will love you, and you, they, you'll find yourself in leadership by being a good writer. So you, you will hardly ever hear this. I'm, I, I didn't hear all of Chuka's talk, but I, I, I suspect he didn't say this. So I'm glad I said something that Chuka didn't say. Um, you hear, hardly hear any tech person tell you about the power of writing. Um, and many of us, because we think we understand, no, not we think, we, we know we understand English and we know we, we have to do in study English. So we think we're good writers. Majority of us are not. And by spending some time, a fraction of the time that we're going to spend learning how to program or how to do AI, by spending that time as an adult, now they know how we're small, we're not very serious and we're making us write. By spending a bit of time like learning how to write well, clean English, very strong English, you will um, uh, give yourself a gift, a huge boost in being an MVP. Just like in football, I use, this, I use images of footballers, right? Just like in football, Everybody can shoot. Of course, everybody can shoot. Shooting is so simple. It's elementary. My kids can shoot. But being an accurate uh, kicker, David Beckham, and so on, became MVPs by practicing this most fundamental skill over and over and over again until they got very good. All right, so let me leave that alone. So these are some of the things that, my, um, that Trika talked about. Uh, but I, I'll make it about having a goal and figuring out exactly what you want to do. Uh, but just to make it crisp, right? I think in the first instance, yes, it's never too late to dream a new dream or have a new goal. Um, so I don't know what age and what level that many of you are at. I'm assuming that many of you are trying to change, change, find a new role. Um, I would say that you sharpen the content that you can give you about the decision making and so on and so forth. You sharpen it by coming up with a clear, definite goal. I give an example. By March 1st, I will be working at company XYZ as a ABC, earning X number of money. You know, in Chuka's story, Chuka talked about how when people ask him, can you do networking? He would say yes. You know what that thing Chuka was doing is like a goal, it's like goal setting. It's because now he has said yes. So the people have said, and that he will, he will, he will, he will do it in a month. So that creates a goal that makes him have to really channel all his efforts and focus in on learning that thing. So you might not have anybody to say, do you want to be a developer? Do you, can you be a website? And you say yes. And that, have a, that gives you a real force to go. But you articulating a statement this way creates the same out impact that Chuka, who's from urban original planning. Um, me, I studied computer science and math and software engineering. Chuka is a far more superior engineer than me um, from his urban original planning because of this secret of he created one inadvertently one way or the other goals clear sharp goals so you have to do that if you do that by march if you, whatever is your date you will find that you have almost certainly achieved what you're trying to achieve and if you don't you will be like a footballer playing on a field without goalposts um, of course, you want to win. We wanted to win is not the issue, but you cannot win because there's no goal post, so you can't score. Um, so I won't go in more into that because Trick has talked about it, about researching and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, and he talked about making a plan. Um, you want to, like, give yourself a deadline to answer the X, Y, Z, and ABC in this my statement. 
a, a, a fixed date by which you must have decided, you won't, you won't decide the company first. Maybe you can, you can decide how you can figure out where you want to go. Which, which you must have decided the ABC, because the ABC that's, I will be working at XYZ company as an ABC. So that ABC, don't take forever to decide. You might say, give yourself 14 days, for example. In that 14 days, don't do anything else with your spare time. And if you don't have a job, then all your time is spare time. All you should do is research. Don't apply for jobs during that time, 14 days. All you should do is get the information that you need to make a decision about what you are going to then commit to do. Um, so some questions, how much like earn, what skills are good for that field, what is the plan, and so on and so forth. Let me move on. Then in achieving your goal, make a plan. Chuk has talked about this, I'm not gonna say he did it much better than me. Um, but one point that he um, um, uh, you know, what I'll say is that, you know, your plan again should should be like, I don't know if you guys know project plan, project management, but you basically break down that three months. If it's March 1st, that is your deadline. Then, like I said, by January 15th, by, by, in week one, I will read X materials. In week two, I will read X materials. By January 15th, I'll start reaching out to people. You, you create that really, really specific, explicit plan. It doesn't mean that you're going to hit all those goals, but it just gives you an anchor um, by which you can um, uh, execute. And when you're behind, then you know you're behind. And then, um, you know, find a mentoring or a peer group. Um, if you can do that, you know, doing this last, this second point of having a peer group um, will increase your chances, probably 10x of achieving your goals, um, especially if you set hard goals. What do I mean by peer group? You know, find one or two people. You know, the US Marines have something called boot camp, or uh, I think it's called boot camp. Um, that is it's almost impossible. Like a normal human being should not be able to make it through uh, that thing of physical challenge, very challenging. But they find that a lot of people make it. And then they studied this, this lady called uh, uh, Angela Duckworth in her book, Grits, studied why do people make it through. No one can make that thing. But there are normal people and they make it. And she found that a big part of it has to do with the fact that they are in groups. They are cohorts. They form a strong bond. And there's something about two or three working on something together that produces exponential outcomes. Um, so some important roles that are uh, hot now, software development, quality assurance, UI, UX, digital marketing, product management, copywriting, and sales. So all these, these things I have listed here, if you are good at these things, you get a job in a month. Like anybody that can do any of these things in Nigeria today, even during COVID, and Dekago we produced, Dekago started two years ago. Between when we, Dekago produced software engineers, between when we started Dekago, and when COVID started, we had only produced 70 engineers. When COVID started, there's a lot of research that says that about 40% of people that had jobs have lost their jobs during COVID. But from when COVID started till now, we have produced as many engineers, just because it wasn't intentional, we already had them in the pipeline, and yet they've all gotten jobs. So at a time when half of the people that have jobs are losing their jobs, we have placed double the number of people that were ever placed in jobs because it's an in-demand skill, software development. So QA, UI, UX, digital marketing, product management, copywriting, and sales. Sales, it's strange that sales is there. There is no company in Nigeria that doesn't need sales. People think sales, people don't like sales. If you, it's the same like software engineering and tech companies need sales. All these people that are raising money, pay stacks that raise a whole bunch of money, Shola and Vedra, they were engineers, they were not salespeople. They needed salespeople, they hired sales, any salesperson they can find that is good, they'll hire the person. Any salesperson that interest which can find now that is good, they'll hire the person. Even if they have hiring freeze, if the person can sell, they'll hire the person. So if you can be really, really good at selling, especially selling in tech, learning how to sell tech products, um, you will get a job um, and you will excel. They will be promoting you, telling you no more promotion because you made commission that you want to stay as a salesperson because you're making money. So finally, you know, how to stand out as an MVP is to serve deeply. Put yourself in the seat, this is after you've gotten the job now. Or if you've not gotten the job, do this anyway. The company you want to work at, put yourself in the CEO's shoes, research the CEO, research the company, 
or your immediate boss's shoes. Think about what problem do they need to solve? How can they achieve their goals? Um, and what skills would you have that will help that person to be successful? What I'm saying is, you know, like if you were working for me and the people who I have loved the most, um, there are some people that work. There's a guy that worked for my first company, a guy that worked for me that I'm so grateful to him to, for how well he served me that I named my only son after him. Can you imagine that? He, because he served me, he was thinking about what can I do to help Chica achieve his dream. And he was doing it. His name is Banky Jutalaya. And he was doing it. Um, and he did it. So your boss will not just promote you. You'll your, you be, you be most valuable if you are sleeping, not thinking about how am I going to get a promotion or how am I going to get a job, um, but thinking how am I going to help the CEO of the company that I want to work for to be successful, or when you're already in, as you're already in, my direct boss who is responsible for delivering X, Y, Z, what am I going, and when you're thinking deeply about it, you will get insight. Maybe that's what you're praying about. You receive insight and you, you come and tell them, of course, we know in the Bible, this is what got people like Joseph and so on promoted. Um, I won't go into this because of time. Um, but you can look it up. It's from a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's, it's called What Does It Mean to Be a Level 5 Executive? It starts from being a highly capable individual, which is where you may be. And then the set of things that you have to, qualities that you have to build up. Um, I'm saying it just in passing. Um, but it's super important. So it will guide your career and it will help you determine all the way to become a CEO, um, uh, how you should be thinking about growth um, and the gaps you should be understanding in your life. Um, so I'll stop there. I said I was going to take 10 minutes, I took 20. So maybe I don't, so probably I don't really have time for questions, but maybe I can take one or two. Um, Hi, Chika. We have some questions in the chat box. Um, maybe I can read out one or two, then maybe you can answer the other ones in the chat box. I think the first question says, um, hi, I'm a junior web and UI designer, starting out uh, a design agency for more advantageous working as a designer. Is it more, is, it, is starting out as a design agency more advantageous than working as a designer in-house for a tech company, or does it matter at all? Um, I think it doesn't matter so much, right? There's probably, of course, design agency, there are different types of design agencies. So if you're in a good design agency, you get to work on many different people's products and you get a breadth of experience. So that's very good. So you think about like in accounting, you know, all the KPMG and all those places, uh, you know, they are like very important because they do auditing for many people. And so then after people go and bring higher people from there. So that logic probably applies in tech as well to some extent. Uh, but I think being in a good company that has good, if you're a junior that has good seniors, People that are, that's what is actually special about the KPMG and McKinsey and all those companies. It's not that, it's really that there are people, managers that are really, really good that you learn from. So when you're a junior, you actually are like an apprentice, actually. Think about yourself, think about like mechanics. You're like an apprentice mechanic, actually. And how good you'll be to a large extent in your first job in your career is determined by how good your master, your guy is. That's really a secret uh, you know, that um, if you have a choice of companies, make the decision based on who are you going to be working for. Like specifically, who is the person who you are going to be working for? Um, because you will learn and grow rapidly if you're working for the right person. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very sound <coughs> answer. I think, um, let me take another one. Um, says, what are the key skills a tech person should have? And how do you decide if you fare better as a full stack developer a mobile app developer, and how do you choose right your best fit area in tech? Uh, I think also, to be honest, that's not so important. 
it, that those decisions are not that important um, in the sense that maybe DevOps might be a little bit different. I think DevOps requires like very, very strong communication more than the others. Um, but as in strong, you being a good communicator, uh, maybe more than the others. Trick, I can talk about this. Um, <coughs> um, otherwise, you know, a full stack developer and a mobile app developer, you can actually change at some point in your career if you want. Um, so I would, if I was, if I was neither of these things, and I already decided to be a developer, I would make the decision based on other con other considerations, like the opportunities I have to to start my career. Meaning, let's say. I know somebody who is a very good full stack developer. I have a chance to intern as a full stack developer. Then I'll choose that um, because they, yeah, I think they're not so. Especially as somebody just started, they're probably not different enough. Let me hand that over, to, uh, pass that over to Chika to, to comment on that. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for that, Chika. Um, so some of it, some of the things you've already hit some of the notes. But if if you wanted to give specific advice. Um, here's what I, I tell you to do, right? If I'm looking at it from the like core engineering perspective, right? One is um, you need to be able to play to your strengths, okay? You need to be able to play to your strengths. Like he's already talked about, for a DevOps engineer, you not only need to be able to um, communicate properly, but you also need to be willing to work at odd hours because DevOps engineers tend to kind of work round the clock, okay? Um, now that separates that from full stack and mobile developer. The difference between a full stack engineer and a mobile engineer is, is this, and this may help inform your decision. With a full stack engineer, you can work across three roles. One, a back end role, a front end role, and then a mobile role, depending on the kind of tools that you use to learn both front end and back end. Whereas if you say that you want to stick to just becoming a mobile developer, then, you know, you then I would advise focus on, you know, the big three. So you have for iOS, you have for Android, and then you have for, um, well, Windows Phone, and those are the big three. Um, so, but then you have to specialize, you know what I mean? So you have to, you have to pick up maybe, for example, Kotlin or Java, you have to pick up Swift. Or, or C++, so you have to pick up, I'm not sure what Windows is, it's, I think C Sharp, right? So the, 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 the key thing, the thread here that I'm trying to point out is the flexibility, okay? The flexibility versus the opportunities that you have available to you. What is the easiest role for you to, 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 what is the easiest role that you can find for you to either intern or get a role in? That should also influence. That's one strategy. Another strategy is then, you know, pick up air quotes, hello world, pro, um, you know, like simple, try and accomplish a simple project in each of the roles. And in trying to do that, this is the second strategy, right? In trying to do that, you will then know which one you enjoy and which one you thrive at. Because it's not enough to just do it on a day to day. I think you should have a passion and enjoy doing it so that you would have longevity in it and actually be effective at it, you know? So DevOps is probably the only exception to that rule because it does require that you monitor the infrastructure, look at it, make sure it gets from staging to prod or from dev to, and so on and so forth. It involves a whole lot of communication actually. So um, I hope that helps. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Chika. Thank you, thank you, Chika. We really appreciate your time. Um, I don't know if there's any other question, but if there is, would um, obviously direct it to you to help answer. We have our next speaker waiting, and I'm sure um, this is going to be exciting because it's talking about Canada. Um, so we have Mr. Tunde Omotoye. Mr. Tunde Omotoye will be discussing the topic international employability. 
He's a seasoned passionate professional who is presently a senior business operations analyst in one of Canada's B5. In his present role, Tunde oversees the HR aspect of the business management operations team of the largest technology operations department of his organization. Prior to now, he was the lead operations resource for the networking department in one of the largest insurance companies in Canada. In that role, he maintained a core balance between playing a HR specialist where he looked into creating critical thought process plans for the networking department while having an overview of the system related issues of um, countrywide. He's presently a West and ILTS ambassador. Also in June 2020, he founded Human Squad, an immigration plus personal branding Toronto based tech company. That starts that helps people navigate their Canadian immigration journey. I put our virtual hands together as we welcome Sundio Motoe to the to, 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 to the stage. Hi, talk Hi, hello everyone. Um, sorry, I'm just joining. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me, talk yeah, I can hear you too. Okay, okay, great. I just wanted to, to be sure. Uh, thank you. And sorry, I'm just getting here. I was just finishing from the Legal Digital Summit and then I quickly jumped on uh, this session. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Tunde Omotui. I have a slide to actually share. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll be talking about international employability today. Um, okay, so... Yes, so name is Tunde Omotoye. Um, I'm president in Toronto. I'm a human resources professional. My background is in HR. A little bit introduction about myself. I have a human resources background. Um, I arrived in Canada as a student. I entered one of the largest insurance organizations in Canada as a human resources compensation and benefit specialist. And I became a certified HR professional. Afterwards, uh, I was able to go and become a senior operations resource in one of Canada's big five. Uh, became a West ambassador in 2019. And I founded Human Squad in uh, 2020, June, where we tried to connect people directly from anywhere in the world to uh, consultants who are, who are here. That's immigration consultants who are here because we find a lot of people are either being duped or they are overwhelmed or they don't know the right pathway for them. And also I became an IELTS ambassador uh, this year in September. So that's a brief about myself. So I'll be talking about international employability. And I feel like uh, being a subject matter expert and somebody who's in this part of the world who has also uh, worked with a lot of other stakeholders in my field, you know, in different parts of the world, the UK, uh, India, US, I, I can actually, to an extent, talk about um, international employability. So what really is international employability? Right, a set of skills and understandings, you know, and personal attributes that make you as a person, you yourself a person likely to gain employment. So it makes you employable, right? And be successful in, in whatever chosen occupation on a global scale, not just uh, your, where you are or where you are located, right? On a global scale. So means that if I was a software developer, say for instance, in Obama Shaw, and I want to get a job in Germany as a software developer, uh, am I employable? How do I make myself, you know, how do I actually position myself for somebody, for an organization in Germany to employ me? Um, so basically that's what um, international employability means. So for me, I always try to uh, boil down its core skills, you know, that you need as a person um, for you to be internationally employable. First is communication and I know we've talked about this a lot. We've, you know, hammered on communication a lot, but communication goes beyond um, how you speak or, you know, you've been able to write, right? It goes beyond that. There's a lot of understanding that has to go into communication, especially when you are playing with people who have different background than you. You know, you are in the same field with people who who don't look like you, right? You have to understand communication in a different perspective, right? Uh, for instance. You know, uh, your culture as a person might accept you 
touching somebody to greet them or you tapping on somebody to get their attention. Another culture might not like that, right? And being internationally employable, being able to work with people on a, on a different um, platform or in a different space, in a different com community that you is accepting the fact that they might be different and the way you communicate with them has to also be different. So communication, and to be a good communicator, you need to also be able to listen, right? Many times you find that you know, most of us, we only listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. We don't listen to actually, you know, have um, a, a logical reason of what uh, what message the person is trying to pass and us being able to respond to those key things that they want us to address, right? Um, two is being able to empathize. You know, uh, empathy is a big deal when it comes to working with people from different backgrounds. Right. Another thing is being, I mentioned this already, being able to draw uh, logical conclusions and being able to build rapport and also acting accordingly upon the information that you gather, right? Uh, most times it might just be a one-liner that is sent to you and you're expected to build like a five-page report on it, right? Uh, your communication skills will be able to help you do that as well. So I'm going to break down these two, which is communication and uh, second one, which is teamwork and collaboration. Uh, for teamwork and collaboration, like I said also, it, because you're going to be working with people with different background, with different background right? Uh, people who speak different languages, right? People who have different cultures than you, you have to be able to know how to fit yourself you know, into a team, right? And that collaboration skills also has to really show Right, and being able to work with people of different backgrounds, ages, religions, and political options. Right, because for for instance, now uh, when I worked when I worked in Lagos, um, you know, most of the people I worked with were Lagosians, or and I would say maybe eighty percent were actually from the south. Right, we we understood ourselves, like we could collaborate um, easier because, of course, I'm a Yoruba guy. Maybe five other of my colleagues are Yoruba people. Right, so it will be easy for us to, you know, relate on in that on that same level. But imagine now me having, you know, somebody from China, somebody from India, somebody from Russia, different people, different perspective, different opinion. Right, I have to be able, I have to know how to collaborate with these people without clashing, without, you know, trying to force my opinion on anybody, you know, without trying to force my own beliefs on them. Right, accepting people and being open. Or, you know about uh, criticism and also trying to learn a lot of things, right? So, also recognizing each team member's strengths and weaknesses, accepting ac accountability for results, resolving conflicts within the team, and being an empathetic team member, like I had mentioned before. So, the other ones uh, I'll just briefly mention, just so that I don't take much of our time. The other one, of course, is problem solving. You know, you want to be somebody who knows how to solve problems. Right um, in team meetings, in projects, you know, you, you get a task. You are not going back to your your um, your superiors or your supervisor or your manager every every now and then, trying to get them to solve something from you for you, right? And you have to be able to show that you've also solved things in the past. That you are a good problem solver. Uh, fourth is you you show initiative, right? It's not until you have been asked to do this that you do it. Right, you know how to plan and organize. You, you, are, you know how to self-manage yourself. Nobody is going to be breathing down your neck, you know, outside um, in, in many parts of the world. Nobody is going to be breathing down your neck and be micromanaging. You have to be able to manage yourself, you know, end to end. Your 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 task is starting, it's ending, is all in your hands. Yeah, you have to be able to deliver, and it's all boils down to self-managing yourself. And another thing is learning. And learning goes beyond just learning. It also goes to unlearning things and relearning things. And learning also, you have to be able to show that, you know, you have that culture of learning in you. You see many times uh, people do some free online courses and all, and they just put it on their resume just so that they show that they've done it. But some employers actually look at it that, okay, if I'm going to spend some money on this guy, Right, who is actually taking initiative by himself to learn by himself without being under pressure or without uh, anybody influencing it. That means if I'm going to put money on him, he's actually going to learn and you know not waste our money practically. Right. And lastly, obviously, you have to be tech savvy. 
We saw what happened with COVID-19, how everybody had to move to remote working. You know, most companies were maybe like 50% working remotely where you have people having um, hybrid model of working two days um, at home, three days at work, or one day at home, four days at work. But now everybody is fully uh, remote where, you know, you are working, everybody's working from home fully. So, and how you get to achievement of these things is being tech savvy. You know, there are some tools where you collaborate online. If you don't know how to use those tools, it becomes very hard for you, right? And you have to basically to stay employable, you must keep abreast of technologies that are relevant to your own profession. It's, it's as simple as that. So um, I'll jump on to this next one, which says, what really is the future of work? Right? So we are talking about um, international employability, but also we have to consider where is work going to, right? What is the future of work? You know, first is like I mentioned, everything is going fully remote. For me now, I've been working from home since March and it seems we're not going to go back uh, to the office or even start talking about going back to the office until next year, summer or fall, right? So you can imagine, imagine somebody who uh, isn't prepared for that or who wasn't actually thinking of that before and now they are forced to actually work uh, fully from home and organizations as well, right? A, a lot of organizations didn't, didn't see the need, you know, to implement or to invest in a lot of uh, structural components, infrastructure that will make everybody, you know, be able to work from home. But now they are forced to. So COVID-19 is the game changer in that sense. And second is the future of work looks like everybody needs to learn on learn and relearn. We need to you know, follow that uh, cycle. And third is, it's going to be faster, better, simpler technology, which is going to affect uh, virtual work. You know, we are trying to um, make sure everything is in the cloud. We are trying to make sure systems are working faster. We are implementing so much different tools and software are popping up here and there of how to manage. And the good thing is uh, some softwares who, you know, people didn't think they needed them before, you know, are the ones that are now like, making waves, you know, for instance, in the Zoom, nobody, people were not really taking it serious. And look at it now, we are having a boot camp through via Zoom where a lot of us are connecting from different parts of the world, right? So it's faster, it's better, simpler technology, and that it's definitely going to affect work, definitely. And fourth is creativity, collaboration, and communication. And the last one is winning with diversity. You know, many people are beginning to realize, for instance, look at the um, United States, although the Black Lives Matter was trying to, um, uh, you know, imbibe equality in the system, but at the same time, it promotes diversity. You know, many organizations are beginning to see that, oh, we actually need key colored people in some key areas, right? Because it actually promotes diversity and di diversity helps a lot. Why? Because different people with different backgrounds, different perspective, and you get a better outcome, a better result. And that's what uh, the future of work would definitely look like, where we would have um, people, you know, women, more women, even disabled people, you know, at my workplace, I think there are about maybe um, three disabled people who are physically disabled, blind, right? But they have their quota that they are actually contributing you know, and the results are always different. You know, it's always a better outcome. If five people who look like themselves, who think like themselves, who have the same background come together and work on a project, I bet you and I assure you that if five other people who are mixed, you have maybe um, two men, three women, or two women, three men, and you have some form of, you know, different colored people, you know, people with different backgrounds, the, their own result and outcome and betting will actually be better than those other five people, right? So, and that's the future of work. That's what it's going to look like. So, which moves us to this other slide. So for me, as a person in Canada, right, I always try to look at it like in, in terms of employability and I always speak certain states, you know, to talk about or certain cities rather to talk about and look at how can I be employable in those cities. So first is Toronto. And I'm sorry, I don't know if anybody here is from the UK or US, you know, I'll allow, I'll allow you to talk about those cities, but for now we talk about um, the one I am very, you know, uh, conversant about. So Toronto, um, if you are in the tech space, you know that this is a city where uh, you have higher chances of being employable. Right, and the, it's, it's a tech hub basically. Toronto does a tech hub, and we find that a lot of people who move 
here and you know find themselves in Toronto and in the tech space, they get jobs quicker than people in other fields, right? And it's definitely obvious it's a tech hub. Um, I wouldn't want to go into other details of you know the population of Nigerians and all that, but I'll talk more of the jobs in those areas. Second is Edmonton, Alberta. You know, here you have jobs um, in the administrative space. So if you're an administrative assistant, if you're a legal assistant, operations manager, and the likes, you know, you know that this is a city where I'm likely to be employable, right? And like I wrote it here, um, Edmonton is Canada's festival city. So if you are always in the festive mood and you like Ogun, New Yam or Arugu festival, but you want to try something different, this is your city, right? So apart from being employable in this um, you know, in this job group, you are also looking at, you know, having this kind of experience. Third is Winnipeg, Manitoba. I've uh, been there before. So most in-demand jobs here in Winnipeg is, it actually ranges from support clerk, just like administrative one also, uh, support clerk to admin staff and customer service reps. Um, fourth is Ottawa, which is one of another uh, favorite city that I really like. It's the capital um, of Toronto. So it's another tech hub. And so if you don't find yourself in Toronto, if you don't find yourself in Kitchener, Waterloo, or if you don't find yourself in Ottawa as a tech person, you are reducing your chances of being employable. But if you actually, you know, um, relocate or move to a place like Toronto, um, Ottawa, or Kitchener, Waterloo as a tech person, you know, in this kind of country, then you are making yourself more employable because those are the places where uh, techies, you know, get job as quick as possible because of the high demand and because of the growth, you know, you are having at least during the time of um, Donald Trump era when there were kind of policies that didn't favor a lot of companies, a lot of them had to be moving, you know, operations here to Canada. And also because you have um, companies like Google, Facebook, and the like setting up like sub headquarters in these cities and you have a lot of um, organizations that actually do uh, the incubator and all in these um, cities it, there's a growth and need for uh, a lot of uh, tech roles so definitely ottawa is also uh, another tech hub that you're looking at and lastly on my list is quebec so for quebec if you are if you're into the um, you know, medical field, especially specialized nurse practitioner or nurse uh, clinician, you're also looking to move to Quebec. And why I really love Quebec is because if you love the European feel and you speak French, you know, this is really your city. And I, I, I didn't want to leave when I actually visited. So, um, like I said, I'm talking more of international employability and I'm focusing more on Canada, right? Um, um, I haven't worked in the UK or, or the US, but I've worked with people who actually work there because um, I manage, you know, a certain role where uh, we have to work with many vendors in this in this part of the world. But then I'll be talking more about how to be employable in Canada as it relates to international employability. So what do you need? First is a good resume. That's number one thing you need. We all know, I know that we, we talk about this a lot, but a lot of people say, is, is just you know it's just a paper it's just a document but it actually goes beyond that right to be honest if if a recruiter isn't using an ats which is an african tracking system you know they're screening your your resume uh by themselves it actually takes them six seconds to know if they're actually going to continue reading that resume or they should drop it right so some people always tell people is try as much as possible to beat that six seconds rule if you're able to beat the six, six seconds rule you are good and there are three types of resumes, right? You have the chronological resume, you have the functional resume, and you have the combination resume. So the chrono chronological resume are for guys who are like um, uh, kind of pace setters who are doing very well in their field, who have gotten like they, they finished school, they got an internship, and they've been working and be growing in their career, right? So they have rich, consistent professional experience. That's what that's what um, a chronological resume uh, looks like, and those are the people it should be for. Functional resume is for people who have had gaps or kind of changed career somehow, you know, so you have to show your functionality more, right, for a functional resume. And the third is a combination of both, right? So for candidates with a diverse background of experience or where skills and abilities are more relevant than your work experience, then you want to do the combination. So still on that resume, 
Um, I showed here, you know, the list of what a combination resume would normally typically look like. Look like so you start with definitely your name and contact information, your summary objective, your skill and abilities, your professional experience, and your educational history. But then I added, you know, to I said it is important to know that volunteer experience can be included because Canada is big on volunteering. So if whatever country you're trying to be um, internationally employable. At, you have to actually, you know, research about that country to ensure that, well, what is actually big in this in this country, you know, that is probably deficient in mine or that is not big in in my own country. And one thing I noticed is volunteering. You see, um, many companies here actually uh, give employees they could, they give you as more well as two days paid off two two paid days right to go actually and volunteer for any company you want right and what how you want to exhibit that also that you are you know you are somebody that also imbibes that uh, volunteering um, attitude that you show it on your resume right so many times when i get to update uh, people's resume who are kind of new to the country you know i have to add that volunteering um, section to it and i ask people what have you done in the community it could even be that maybe it's your church, maybe you are an usher there, or you are a choir, you, you are volunteer because they are not being paid, and it's a service you are offering, right, for the betterment of a particular, you know, um, uh, co collective or a particular uh, institution, right, so that's volunteering. So here is a table that I, you know, kind of just put down to show you what resume by locations look like. Right, and it shows you the professional, you know, what, what the preferred name, what is being called, you know, the number of pages that uh, such countries will require from you. You know, do you need a photo on resume? Because you find that sometimes people add uh, photos on resume, people don't. Uh, in Germany, for instance, you must add photo on your resume, right? They want to see what you look like, you know, but in North America, it's forbidden, you know, and they, they do that because. Um, we try to cut down on discrimination, you know, as a colored person, if I put my um, picture on a resume, you know, somebody, the, whoever, the recruiter, who might pick it up, my, I, I don't know, the person might not, you know, be somebody that embraces diversity, right, and that might actually limit my opportunity, and that's why you find that on resumes here um, in Canada, you are not supposed to put personal details like your 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 sex your gender rather your gender your age you know all those kind of things is not needed right and even at the interview um your interviewer cannot ask you personal questions because it's part of the law uh, there's actually an act um under the canadian labor act which you know prohibits and forbids employers to actually ask you some certain questions because it will definitely limit um you know your job or your job opportunities. So those are the kind of things you want to consider. You want to, okay, if I'm going to United Kingdom, what, do I, what did they actually expect from me? Right? What do they need on my resume? So this is just a sample, um, a simple combination, you know, resume that I put here from what I already outlined here. And so moving next, so I mentioned first, I mentioned resume, second is job agents. So you find that there are actually some um, um, organizations or platforms in different countries who actually recruit people from outside their country. So for instance, we have some international recruitment agencies in Canada who recruit for companies from outside outside Canada, right? So, um, and I've listed them here. You have Michael Page, who is in Toronto. You have Island Recruiting, who is in Prince Edward Island. You have Canada Connect, who is in Winnipeg, for anybody who, you know, who's thinking of going to Winnipeg. You have Renal International, who is in Toronto. You have Global Hire. Edmonton, you have Hayes Recruitment Canada, they are in Vancouver, you have Work Global Canada, then St. John, you have Alliance Online, who's in Winnipeg, you have Drake International, who's in Toronto, and you have Hire Immigrants, who is in Toronto, also you have Outpost Recruitment in Vancouver, and Cohen International Montreal. So um, these organizations have platforms and websites where when you go there, you create a profile. Some of them have, uh, you know, platforms set up where you can create a profile. Then they review your resumes or they review your background, your experience and all that. And then they tell you where you can actually fit into or what um, organization is looking to hire someone of your background, right? Or another thing is 
some some of them who don't have such platforms, you can basically shoot an email, reach out to them and say, okay, I'm in this part of the world. I, I, I'm trying to be employable in this part of the world, in this particular city, this is my background. How do you think I can achieve it? And because this, um, recruitment agencies actually get paid for, you know, fulfilling roles and for hiring people. They also, you know, put in a lot of effort for you as a person to ensure that you get what you need. And yeah, these are more recruitment agencies that I listed here. So I listed them here without their cities. And so I've mentioned resume, I mentioned um, recruitment agencies. The third is job bank and sites. So if I want to be employable, say for instance, in Germany, right? And I'm in the tech field, what I'll do is I'll actually go to some job sites and search those kind of jobs, web developer, Germany, right? I'll search by job uh, title and I'll search by location. So it gives me those role um, of you know the openings in Germany, um, I, I'll click it and then I'll look you know in details. What are the requirements? What are they looking for? Right? What what what, what knowledge do they require of me to have? Right? And then that way I will know how to either work towards achieving or learning those um, those skill sets or adding them to my resume if probably I already have them and I did not add them before. So the job banks that I mentioned here, number one, Indeed, obviously, you know, Indeed is big everywhere. And they have, I think, a database of, uh, one of the largest database of job openings in, every, in uh, almost every part of the world, right? And ZipRecruiter as well. So you also want to go to an organization's career page. Say for instance, I mean, maybe um, somewhere in Accra, Ghana, right? And maybe I'm working in PwC and I'm looking to move to France, PwC in France. What do I do? I go to PwC, I go to our website, right? I go to the organization's career page and see what openings they might have in PwC France, right? And try to tailor that to my, you know, my own resume or try to tailor my expectation to what should I expect? What should I be looking out for? What should I do, right? So also, even if I wasn't working there, maybe I, 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 I'm dreaming of working in uh, somewhere in California someday in, in the head office of one of these um, tech companies, right? In San Francisco or something like that, right? I will go to their website, look at what they are looking for, or look at the people that are working there, what do they have, right? So that way I make myself more employable, you know? And last, lastly, LinkedIn. Right, it's as simple as going there, searching for um, maybe um, I'll say if I was looking for if I was looking to become a human resources professional in China, I'll go I'll go there and and, and actually tweak my search feature to look to pull out people who are human resources resources professional in China. Let me see what they have. What certification do they do even, do they even uh, need or require of me? What are the eligibility requirements that I need to achieve uh, such uh, certifications? And finally, is actually looking for hidden jobs, right? Those are that's like the fourth thing. Looking for hidden jobs. How do you find hidden jobs through your network and through professional association? With network, how you do it? How do it is? Um, okay, I have a friend who's left the country maybe three years ago. He's now in the U.S. Right, uh, maybe maybe it's in the same field, maybe not. But reaching out to them and asking, "Hi, I'm actually you know thinking of being internationally employable, and you know basically I'm thinking of relocating. And what are the pointers? What do you think I should have? What do you think? Who, where do you think I should go? Right, and they'll be able to provide more information. And you see, the last one, which is professional association, is quite difficult because. In most cases, you have to be located in that particular place before you can join some of these professional associations. And the benefits of joining these professional associations are that um, they say that the, the clique, you know, the association that you belong to, right, they, they, sh they give you information first before giving somebody outside, right? So you benefit from that by belonging to that professional association. Right? For me, when I moved here, um, before I got my certification, I, I was already part of the Human Resources Professional Association. And that was where I kept getting a lot of information, a lot of resources that I needed to practice for my certification. And afterwards, even you know, volunteering in such an association also opens you to a lot of opportunities, right? So what is the immigration pathway for a job outside Canada? Say for instance, now, okay, I'm thinking of, um, I know that I'm ready, you know, uh, I want to be employable in Canada. What immigration pathway do I need to get there? There are a lot of uh, immigration pathways to come into Canada. You know, the primary one, which takes um, the most people to Canada yearly, 
second 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 to the most rather because the most is uh, study pathway which is students um is fsw that's under the economic immigration pathway the fsw which is called the federal skilled workers so for that one you don't need a job offer to come to canada right you just need to to meet some certain requirements you have to get i you have to have done ielts get your education uh, credentials evaluated um eca um we have west doing that and lastly you must have at least minimum of one year experience but it's good also good to have more right and you must fit to a particular job knock right and that way you can fall into an express entry pool where your points are calculated through a method and then people are chosen based on a particular threshold or cutoff so but the immigration pathway when it comes to getting a job is called an lmi work visa right so with this one you must first of all get a job Right in Canada, when you get a job, then you apply for um, uh, what's it called an LMIA, and once it's approved, then uh, you can get your work visa and move to Canada. So, like I said here, for this one, you need a Canadian job offer. You apply for work visa, and then on that basis, you move to Canada. So the simple steps are: you secure a Canadian job offer first. Um, you have the Canadian employer apply for an LMI on your behalf through the Service Canada. And the third one is you, um, once your LMI is approved, then you apply for a work visa. And I did put the link here for, you know, um, the LMI steps and if you need more information about it. So um, there's, it's over there. And yeah, so I rush, I know I probably practically rush through that, but I know that I don't have a lot of time. So tales and tips, um, I just want to give you a little short story about Adelaide Street. So which happened to me here in Canada when I was trying, you know, you know, international employability, I was trying as much as possible to get myself employed. And that was when I was in school and I was looking for internship because um, for me, I, I had, I did a program where um, there's an internship attached to it. And when you get an internship, it kind of, you know, it's part of your, your curriculum, it's part of your study. You have to get an internship to also graduate, you know, sort of. So I had, I had submitted over 78 applications, right? I think it was my third interview, which happened in Adelaide Street. So Adelaide Street is a street in Toronto, right? And I was in Kitchener. So I'll, I'll paint the picture here for you. So imagine somebody coming from like maybe an Obomo shore, right and the person is coming to lagos for an interview and you know you're coming to lagos you're seeing the bridge the flyover you're seeing all the skyscrapers and all so that was what happened to me you know i was living in kitchener which was more like um a laid-back city and i was coming to toronto for an interview and i was seeing all these skyscrapers you know seeing people wearing suits you know briefcase and all like people all you know, well dressed, and I'm like, wow! It looked, it looked practically looked like Wall Street, and for for once, it felt like I was reaching out to my dreams physically because you know that was what I always pictured a working, you know, professional to look like, and what the environment should look like. But I was taken away by that experience, you know, getting then I got out of the train and I saw it, and I saw the skyscraper. I was like, whoa, right? And then I saw everything that was happening around. Unfortunately, though, my phone did die during that process. So I, I kept telling people that I was going to Adelaide Street because I'm a Yoruba man, right? Look at this, this is spelled Adelaide if you look at it very well, but it's not Adelaide, it's Adelaide, right? So I, everybody I met, I, I told them I was going to Adelaide Street and then no, it was a third person that said, do you have written anywhere? Fortunately also I had already printed stuff before my phone died. So I showed the person, I said, oh, you're going to Adelaide Street. Right. And it was even quick the way he mentioned it. Even I saying Adelaide Street is still, you know, they probably still won't understand. Right. So the person uh, directed me to where it was and then I went for the interview. But I got there, I got there 10 minutes late. I was destabilized already, of course, by the environment, by what I saw. And I didn't get that job. But fortunately, the fourth interview I went for, you know, I got the job. Not in Toronto, though, but later I finally moved to Toronto. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes you have to understand where you are going to. Right, you have to understand what is expected of you. What should I expect? What should I look out for? Right, and that way you can better position yourself for being employable internationally. So, uh, thank you. I hope I didn't rush uh, through that. And if there are any questions, I'm definitely happy to take them. Thank you.
Okay. Um, hi, Tunde. Thank you so much for, for your time. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, as a mass teacher, what yeah. is your advice on where to be employed in Canada? Uh, as, as a mass teacher, you know, you are, you are probably looking at uh, Quebec. So Quebec has a very good pathway for teachers. However, I find that Nigeria is not on that list, unfortunately. I don't know why. But Quebec has a direct uh, kind of stream for teachers. And they, they listed a couple of countries. I think it's about 55 countries. But Nigeria is not there for them. Uh, I really don't know why. However, as a math teacher, you are probably also looking at maybe you being um, a data analyst or you are kind of conversant in data analysis. So you want to be picking tools. You know, want to be picking such tools or also thinking of, you know, maybe picking up another course that is actually related to maths. I believe that somebody who is good, who is a who is a good mathematician will most likely be a very good uh, data analyst as well. And that way, you are also aligning yourself to the tech um, environment, which also you know increases the opportunities in cities like Toronto, Ottawa, and uh, what's it called, uh, Kitchener Waterloo. All right, great. Um, I think well, a couple of your uh, participants are asking if it's possible that you share the slides with them. Oh yeah, I'll share the slide with you and then you can definitely- can cascade know. it down. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. No um, we also have someone asking for opportunities for digital marketers in Canada. Okay, um, for digital marketers, you want to be around the tech city, that's the tech hub, because a lot of um, startups, a lot of um, the tech organization definitely make use of digital marketers. You know, um, they make good use of digital marketers and that way, you know, you can uh, definitely increase your chances. So I'll say for me, I'll even say Toronto off, for, off the top of my head, you know, digital marketer, go to Toronto. There are a lot of people, you know, who make use of such services. If you already have experience in that, you have an IELTS, you have IELTS, good um, band score, you know, you've evaluated your uh, credentials, you know, you definitely can fall into the um, FSW and express entry pool. All right, fantastic. I think yeah. um, we have another one says, as a banker, what certification yeah. can um, can I work on and which city is best? Um, so for banking, it's, you know, um, everywhere. However, for banking, I know that um, there are a couple of, usually there are terms security, security certifications, right, for bankers, especially if you are not just maybe um, a customer interfacing uh, banker, right? You are more like maybe operations and all. I find that I, I can't really remember the name of that certification off the top of my head, but when I do, I'll definitely send it to you and you can share with them. But I, I know that there's a particular certification, like it's a, like a security certification. I know somebody who moved from Nigeria here and then they had to do it to increase their chances and they were able to um, get a job and also kind of grow in that uh, banking, banking space. All right, that's that's clear. I think lastly, um, for someone who is a qualified accountant with ICANN here and uh, has big four experience, uh, oh, wow. what um, city uh, would you suggest, and what suggest. kind of entry um, should the person pursue? Okay, uh, for somebody who is in the big four and has an ICANN, I know that I'm very sure. So for for Canada, it's called the CPA. Um, which is uh, for professionals who are in the accounting world, right? There's CPA, but I know that you can convert your ICANN to CPA, right? There's some certain uh, requirements, the eligibility requirements that you have to actually meet and follow, right? To be able to get your CPA. And you can actually start it from Nigeria. I actually tweeted about it, I think some weeks ago, even last month, you know? So, and I, I shared the link where you can actually start the process of converting your ICANN to CPA. And, you know, you are not bound by by city because back even there in Edmonton, you have like uh, PwC, you know, you have uh, the likes of uh, KPMG and all that. So they are spread across and you can be in any city, right? And that way you can, you know, you can increase your chances because you already, you know, you've already passed through the big four, even if you are still in the big four, right? So the first step I would say is try to convert your um, ICANN to CPA and then, you know, uh, look for the right city that you want to move to. And you can follow the FSW pathway as well. 
Ah, uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. I think that's the last question. Okay. Um, maybe other one that comes after the um afterwards, we can just direct them to you. Okay. Um, no for proper so hope you address them. All right. Thank you so much. It's no been a problem. pleasure. You definitely be here from all of us. Come and join you there. <laughs> definitely. No problem. No problem. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right, we'll be going to our last session for today. We have Mr. Kayo Mola with us. We put our virtual hands together to welcome Mr. Kayo. All right, just give me a second to read without his profile. Just a second. So. All right, Mr. Um, Mr. Ogumola will be discussing the topic data analytics and the world. He's a technology education entrepreneur with over nine years experience in product management, international development and technology leadership. He has lived and worked in four different countries and also led at the VP level of a consulting company. Mr. Itayo is the founder of Utiva, a leading technology education company in Sub-Saharan Africa that helps Africans learn tech skills that are relevant for the future of work. He holds a master's degree in business strategy, leadership, and change from Harriet Watt University. He is an MIT solve entrepreneur, 2020 Facebook Accelerator leader, Halkion Incubator Fellow, Global Goods Funds Fellow, Chevening Scholar, Atlas Core Fellow, 2019 Unleashed Talent. Last year, he was nominated for Future Awards Africa under the education category, and most recently, was also nominated for the Tech Times Awards, Tech Times Africa Awards under the CEO category. That's such an impressive resume. Can you put our virtual hands once again as Mr. Itayo goes ahead to take this session? Great. Thank you so much, Tomitokwe, um, for having me. Um, I do apologize uh, if I am not delivering at my best. Um, I feel quite very, very terrible. Um, I had a bit of food poisoning, so I just had to take the moment to um, to relax in the morning. Um, but this this is quite very important to me, and also because I do acknowledge the the value of of what we are doing. Um, I, I I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm able to um, to deliver value to um, the participants. My name is Itayo again. I lead Utiva. I am going to be switching my, my video just sometimes and switch it off again because I, I pretty much don't like the way I look. Um, so thank you so much, guys, for having me. Today, what I want to help you achieve is to, to, um, to understand uh, the value of data analytics, the value of data analytics, especially with the fact that the world is changing. And... You know, data analytics is beyond just the balls that we are hearing every day. Data analytics is now what drives the entire economy. And I will show you why, you know, why data analytics is what drives the entire economy. I would also share my slides in just a few minutes. So, but before then, let us just pretty much, you know, um, understand you know, why data analytics is super important. The first thing I want, you know, to, to, talk, to let you guys acknowledge is the fact that, as I had mentioned at the beginning, business is no longer as usual. Business is no longer as usual. Things have changed. And when we say that things have changed, what do we mean? We mean that um, we, 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 we are having a situation where there is a higher convergence of technology. What does that mean? That means that 
unlike before, we are interacting so much with technology than you can ever imagine. So for instance, you're using your mobile phone to do pretty much almost everything. Banking transaction, you know, coordinating your transportation, you know, healthcare. I know, I'm sure some people among us use uh, mobile phones for, you know, um, I, know, I know Samsung and iPhone has this, this, um, this mobile app that helps you to check, you know, the rate at which your heart is breathing, your heart, your, your heart rate, you know, your, your breathing rate, um, I've forgotten most of those medical terminologies, the rate at which you're, you're exercising and all those things. You know, we're interacting with the mobile phones and organizations actually acknowledge that reality. So what we are now experiencing is because as humans, we are interfacing so much with technology, what organizations are now beginning to realize is that, you know, they need to make more business decisions faster because things are changing. And gone with those days that data, you know, is so static. Now, gone are those days where you pretty much make decision based on the data that you gather some years back or gather some months back. Things are changing because humans are interacting faster with this data or interacting faster with our mobile, our, 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 this mobile phones and the technology so the data is changing every minute. So what I'm going to help you understand today is the definition of data. You know, then I will move from there to why data analytics is important. Then I will also help you establish, you know, at some level, the different types of data that you have. Then I'll move from there to talking about, you know, the different types of data analytics that we have. Then I'll also talk about the application of data analytics and we'll round up with some understanding of how you can become data analyst, you know, in this, or how you can apply data analytics to whatever you do today. Okay, so let me just have some minutes to quickly, you know, set up my screen. I just hope that I'm not too far from my mic. Um, I'll quickly do another mic check um, with the with the host. Please, can you still hear me well? Yes, yes, you're audible. Perfect, 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 perfect. Okay, so um, let me quickly share my screen. Just a minute. Okay, so let me see if I quickly, quickly, okay, my, my slides just disappeared. Um, I just wanna quickly pull it up. Just a minute, guys. Okay, I think I now have access to it. Just gonna share the slide in one minute. And and apologize also for all the things, data that you would see. You would see so, some some things from Utiva on that slide. Um, I I can't just take them off. So, um, and by the way, I work with Utiva, so that, that pretty much by default, you know, means that I, I have most of my materials, you know, in Utiva form. Um, so now let me, let me start by helping you guys define data uh, or data science, because most times I hear people get confused whenever they see things like data science, data analytics, and people are trying to understand the difference you know, between the two. Every time you hear the word data science, remember that data science simply means an umbrella term that categorizes everything data, you know, from data analytics to machine learning, to cloud computing, to artificial intelligence, data, 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 data science is much of an umbrella term it's more of an umbrella term than a more specific terminology. So every time you hear the word data science, data analytics, I, I just hope that you can see my screen now. I'm trying to present the screen. Okay, uh, sorry. C can you see my screen, please? Yes. 
Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So every time you hear the word data science, you know, data science is just an umbrella term. We, we use this term to categorize everything that happens in the data world, you know, from um, cloud computing to machine learning to artificial intelligence to internet of things to robotics, you know, it's, it's a group of fields. And in that field, what we pretty much do is to use data to make insightful decisions. We use data to make insightful decisions. So uh, there is a convergence or there is a connection between data analytics, business intelligence, data management, business, uh, business analytics, you know, machine learning, cloud computing, robotics, artificial intelligence, internet of, the internet of things, they are pretty much, you know, converging at the center and we call it data science. So you remember when you were in the secondary school, you know, you were in the science class and people were studying mathematics, which is a science course, you know, um, physics, you know, and um, what were the courses with it? Biology, you know, it, it, all these courses are kind of connected. You know, and it's difficult for you to separate them, you know, totally because they are pretty much, you know, connected together. But data analytics is more focused. Data analytics is more focused on using data to make insightful decisions. And that's pretty much the reason I usually say that data analytics is not just a, an engineering, you know, field. It's a business field. Why? Because... Although there's a bit of, you know, writing of code, if you get to a level, there's a bit of um, analyzing data. There's a bit of using some tools to analyze data. Ultimately, what you're trying to achieve is to make insightful business decisions. That is ultimately what you're looking to achieve. So there are different types of data analytics, but I'll walk you through them very fast because I know that my, I also don't have a lot of time. There's something called data descriptive analytics. Another one is called diagnostic analytics. The third one is called predictive, predictive analytics. And the fourth one, you know, is called prescriptive analytics. These are the four different types of analytics that we have. And every time you do data analytics, you have to remember that you are committed to doing four things. You're committed to doing descriptive you're committed to doing diagnostic, you're committed to doing predictive and also prescriptive analytics. What does, it, what does each of them mean? Now, when you are trying to understand what happened, we call that descriptive. Uh, sorry, when you're trying to understand what happened, we call that descriptive analytics. You know, trying to describe a situation you know, from a data perspective, oh, what we are currently having is more men buying those products than more women. We are achieving more income in this store than this store. You know, the northern region of our business is doing better than the southern region. That is you describing a situation. That is the foundation of data and insight. That is the basic because you need to be able to describe a situation as a data analyst, but you need to go beyond just describing the situation because if I'm your boss and you describe the situation for me, I don't just care about knowing the situation. I also care about knowing why that situation happened. So the diagnostic analytics is you, you know, telling me why those things happened, you know, based on one thing called pattern, pattern. Uh, I was working with an organization in, um, as a consultant some few months ago, and we we're trying to pretty much understand why some people resign, you know, at a level of the organization. And it's quite a fast rising, you know, um, company. We just want to pretty much understand why people resign and why people stay, you know, trying to diagnose the situation using data and use that diagnosis to do the second and the third thing, which is to now predict what is likely to happen. If, if I come to you and I say, oh, the people are resigning at this level and some people are staying at this level, 
we are, we are realizing that more women are getting into leadership in this organization than more men. Then the next thing on my mind as a CEO is why did that happen? Then the next thing on my mind was I understand why it happened. It's now getting to a point where I understand what is likely to happen. Is it that it will, we are going to get to a point that everyone at the leadership level will be women? I don't know. Or everyone at the leadership level will be men. And if I cannot predict the situation, then I'm blinded by the bias of the future. You know, the bias of the future is a very dangerous thing because what happens in the future is that you wake up into that future and then you realize that the future is happening without your, your permission. And, you know, even as Christians, that, that should never happen to us. You know, I, I think that God has, give, God has given us so much, you know, to, to control the future. God has given us so much to control the future. And we can't just wake up into the future and the future is happening and we don't have control over the situation. Why? Because you should have described the past. You should have diagnosed the past. You should have predicted the past. And the last one is that you should have prescribed. So for, to that organization now, we are pretty much prescribing. And one of the things that we realized in that organization is that we realized that the organization, either, I mean, I, I just mentioned that it's a fast rising you know, company and they have more than 40 different projects. Each project has more than eight different folks that are leading those projects and about two different people that are providing support, uh, sorry, eight different folks that are part of the project and two other people that are supporting the project. So if you do the calculation, eight times 40, you know, two times 40 people supporting the project. And then on an average, each project has two years in terms of duration. And what we are pretty much, you know, trying to identify now is, what are the projects that succeed and what are the projects that fail? Those that resign, which project were they part of? Are they part of the project that failed and the project that succeed? You know, the contract that succeed, you know, what is the duration? Just try and like do a deeper dive, you know, on multiple, you know, metrics. Do a deeper dive on multiple metrics, then see if you can find the pattern. I don't know, but see if you can find the pattern. Then we'll do the deeper dive to now understand those that stay with us for more than five years, which school do they attend? Is it the government's university, the private universities? Those that run projects that become successful, what universities did they graduate from? Is it the government university, the private university? Have they attended any course at any time? Have they learned anything? Do we see a pattern between, you know, a pattern among those that went to foreign universities and those that schooled locally? You know, but what patterns help you identify what is likely to happen? And then you can prescribe and determine a course of action, you know, to solve the problem. Okay. Can I get, can I get some feedback in the chat box? I just want to be sure that you guys are following me. So I'm going to share my screen so that I can get some, some, some feedback. Um, okay data science and software engineering. I'm going to talk about the difference between data science and software engineering. Uh, okay, software engineering is you writing codes uh, to develop a program or to build a, a software. Let's put it that way. Uh, to build a software or to develop a code. Uh, sorry, to write some code to develop a software. So at the end of software engineering or software programming, you know, what you're ultimately trying to achieve is to build a software or to... Um, to create um, a mobile solution or, no, it doesn't have to be mobile, to create a solution. Uh, and solution here always come in form of a software. Um, some of the softwares that you use, your Facebook app, your Google you know, platform, da, 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 those kind of stuff are built by software engineers, but not software engineers alone. Data science is you gathering data and using the data to solve problems. So usually data scientists or data analysts once they have done all their data work, they will, be, they will have to submit something to the leadership because the leadership needs to make decisions. You know, leadership needs to make decisions. I, I, will, I will probably get a little bit into this uh, as I move on. Uh, I also know that I don't have the luxury of time. So let me, let me move quite faster. Um, let me move a little bit faster than dun, 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 just a minute. I just want to move a little bit faster. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so I've established the four different types of analytics that we have. And I've also explained those four different types of analytics, you know, 
just so that you, you understand the beauty of analytics. You know, you come and you describe a situation to leadership. You come and you diagnose a problem. So there's a lot of that, so much of diagnosis that you need to do because you need to study the patterns. Sometimes while you're trying to study the patterns, you need to create different models. Then you predict the situation. Then when you're done predicting the situation, then you also prescribe. You prescribe the situation, okay? Now, so why you need to jump on the data ship? Why do you need to become data analysts? Why? That's one of the things that I want to help you answer right now. Why do you need to think data? Why should you be thinking data, sleeping data, you know, praying data? Why? You know, data scientists are now in high demand. You can check yourself on one of the major platforms, like Indeed, you'll see jobs on data science, you know, data analytics, business intelligence, you know, today. Another reason is because, you know, core organizations are now thinking of data, data, data as a way to making, helping organizations or helping themselves, you know, to make decisions. So for example, you pretty much see job opportunities in data science uh, because so many businesses are using data as a form of helping themselves. So think about the work that Amazon does. Amazon uses data science to customize recommendations to you, you know, so that when you buy a product, they also know the type of product that you would need. How do they do that? Patterns, you know, patterns, you know, because they got the last set of people that bought that same product also buy this. So they also predict that you would also need it. And because of the country you have, or because of the location where you are, you know, they use multiple data points, multiple metrics to make decisions. I'm getting some background noise. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Victoria, can you please mute yourself? My check. Do you get some background noise? Okay, I think it's fine now. Whew. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna move on. Um, so Facebook, for example, uses you know data analytics to help you get ads. For instance, you get so many ads on your Facebook, and you wonder how the why those ads are popping up on your platform. Data analytics, data analytics. You know, so for example, there was a time while I was in Scotland, I was gisting with some of my colleagues about getting pizza, and before I know it, I got home. We were gisting. We were not even typing. We were gisting with our mouth. And when I got home, Peter hands were showing on my timeline. And you're wondering how that happens? That is artificial intelligence. That is data analytics. That is high level data analytics. You know, there's a lot of data analytics going on because these companies want to get into your mind. They want to understand what you need so that they can quickly be the first pro to provide you that value. Netflix, for example, you know, uses data analytics to help you make decision on the next type of movie that will be that you would prefer. Ikeja Electric uses data analytics to help you make decision on the bills you show the pain. You know. So let us talk about some of the tools in data analytics. The pretty much easy tools are SQL, Excel. Power BI, these are like the very easy tools that if you have not done anything in data analytics before, these are the three tools that will help you get started. SQL, Excel, Power BI. SQL because of data querying, because you need to query your data. So let's talk about some of the tools that organizations are using out there, you know, for data analytics. Some of the tools that organizations are using out there for data analytics. I think I got muted. My check, can you still hear me, please? Um, my check? You're, you're audible. Okay, great. So one of the major tools is structured query language, SQL. And the, the reason SQL is very important to data hand list is because you need to query your data. What does that mean? That means that most data don't come in form of they don't come structured. Most data don't come structured. They come unstructured and semi-structured. That means that sometimes 
when you gather your data, you have text mixing with words, uh, text mixing with numbers, numbers mixing with symbols. And someone needs to organize this data. Someone needs to structure it. Someone needs to organize it. That is the power of structured query language, SQL. It's pretty much easy to learn SQL because you're just writing codes. And in four days, you can learn SQL. Not that you will get perfect, but if you keep practicing in three months, you know, you'll be surprised at what you can do. In four days, structured learning, you perfect SQL. The next one on my table is Microsoft Excel. It's pretty much easy because we all use it at, at every point, you know. But Microsoft Excel is a little bit more than what you use. So there's an advanced part of it. You know, you can use Microsoft Excel. So one of the things, things you need to learn in Microsoft Excel, you need to learn um, some extra tools or some extra each functionality of that tool. You know, tools like VLOOKUPs, you know, slices, um, Power Query. You know, you need to learn to create financial model with Excel. You need to learn to create charts with Excel. You know, you need to get to the advanced level of Excel. And number two, that is on my list is critical thinking. Yeah, while it's not a tool that man made, it's a tool that God gave, but you need to learn to think well. You need to learn to think on your feet. If you don't like thinking, data science, data analytics is not your space. But if you like finding why problems happen, and what you can do to solve those problems from data perspective, then who you are on the right path. You know, you should be in this industry. You know, critical thinking. Sometimes a data analyst spent all night not even touching his computer, you know, just thinking and co having conversation with his team, trying to figure out what should we be looking for. You know, when you see something, you're thinking with your team and asking yourself, why is it that this one is happening? Could something be happening that we have not figured out? Uh, data analytics is so much about critical thinking. Another tool is R and Python. Uh, this is, these are programming tools because it takes a while to learn it. You know, so pretty much if you commit 10 days to learning Python for data analytics, you'll be able to do some things. And then you can go a little bit deeper by practicing and real, uh, practicing, practicing, practicing multiple pro projects. So I'm just going to take one minute to grab um, a, a cup of water. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you guys. But I see some exciting questions here. But before I grab water, let me mention that Python helps you to structure your data, to analyze the data, and to do what is called data visualization at a very high level. You know. It's pretty much a high level you know, tool because also it's important because it helps you. You need to write some, some language. You need to learn to write some code. So if you're not the type of person that likes to write code, um, don't come to the space. But writing code is very easy. Some people just feel, oh, it's so difficult to write code. So, you know, it's very easy to write code. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna grab myself a cup of water and I'll come back to everybody. I'm back here. Thank you, guys. So um, there are too many opportunities and jobs out there in data analytics. I've mentioned that. Uh, and I don't want to like, go into that so much because if you search yourself, you see so many opportunities. But Excel is one fundamental skill that everyone needs to go learn. If you want to try in, or if you want to get started, if you want to kickstart your journey into data analytics, you need to start with Excel. It's a very marketable skill. Every organization uses it. In small organizations that are playing with data, they use Excel. But don't think Excel is as easy or as simple as you think. So you need to like commit yourself to learning the advanced level and not just learning, also making sure that you practice it every time. 
practically every organization uses Excel because it's flexible and it's because it's easy to use. So if you want to get started, you know, start with Excel. Then when you've learned Excel as a data analyst, the next one is SQL. SQL because you are gathering data from multiple points and those data usually don't come organized. So SQL helps you to uh, begin to structure your data and put sense around your data, structure it, organize it. Sometimes they, you can imagine when your data comes in multiple forms and you have text mixing with words and words mixing with uh, symbols and they're all you know, clustered in one, in one sheet. SQL helps you structure it and organize it. Then you put it somewhere in the cloud so that everyone who wants to use it in the future can retrieve it. That is the power of SQL. Now, SQL is everywhere or every organization, especially you know, those that are playing in the data space, you know, use SQL because they need to structure the data. All these companies that are on my list here use SQL. SQL is one of the biggest names in technology. Okay, uh, SQL is in demand. Um, so you see, in terms of rating the tools in data analytics, SQL is one tool that most organizations are, are using. 35.7% use SQL and 25.7% use Python. Uh, yeah. So SQL is also not going anywhere because, you know, uh, beyond the fact that it's a popular name, the importance of SQL is that it helps to structure data very fast and it's also easy to learn. So uh, that's my, my conviction that SQL is not going anywhere, you know, anytime soon. So thank you so much for listening. I, I hope that I'm, I've been able to touch on some things and also help you spark some interest in data analytics. Uh, let me entertain a few questions. Uh, and I do apologize that I'm unable to, you know, put on my video so much. Uh, kind of feel very, very um, on the on the intense, you know, pressure. But I just want to make sure that I do this and I give you value. Um, yeah, let me hand over back to the to the fast to the facilitator on the host, and I'll be happy to um, you know answer questions as we as we have them. Oh, um, all right, thank all you right, so thanks. much, Intayo. Uh, it's, it's been a blessing listening to you for the past couple of minutes. Um, we have a few questions. Well, one says there is a network slash cyber security professional with less than two years experience. Is there a way for him or her with this limited number of years of experience? Is there a um, way for her? Are there opportunities for this particular individual with this experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, what if I tell you, I'm telling you from the perspective of someone that has trained more than 4,000 people in data analytics, usually those that start data analytics don't even have any form of technical background. They are like people that are coming from the banking sector, people that are coming from the pharmaceutical sector, you know, people that are recent graduates, never had a job before. They're usually those that are coming into data analytics space. Um, so you even have some little bit of background in something around technology and you will try, you know, in the data analytics space. So uh, it usually starts with just uh, getting started, learn the tools, start with the easiest tool, but make sure you don't stop so that you can perfect your art. And I hear someone say, oh, I'm moving out of Nigeria. Uh, one month you can learn Python you know, and one month you can learn Power BI and also learn SQL. So in three months, you would have learned SQL, Power BI, Python. Uh, when I say learn, learn means that you will be taught the practice, the principle, the, the how to do it. Then you would have to commit yourself to a lifeline, lifetime learning, you know, continue to practice, continue to engage, continue to solve problems everywhere that you see them uh, and, you're, and you're good to go. Okay. All right, thank you. I think, um, well, participants are asking for the slides. I hope you can share that afterwards. Uh, we have someone who's asking, what's the place of SQL in analysis aside querying the database? 
Yeah, so SQL is so much around data querying. You know, it helps you query the data. And until data is queried, you know, um, there's pretty much little or nothing that you can do with it. You know, until the data is structured and organized, it can't be analyzed. So SQL is like the foundation of data analytics because if data comes on structure, then someone needs to structure it. Yeah, that's it. All right, Claire, um, we have someone who's asking if it's, if a good knowledge and love for mathematics is required to be successful in data analytics. At the, at the very high level of data science, you would have to fall in love with mathematics at the very high level. Some people, not some, most people that get into data, data analytics, you know, I mentioned that data science is an umbrella term, you know, it's an umbrella term. And I mentioned that data science is an umbrella term. And a part of that umbrella part, you know, is data analytics. For data analytics, you don't need any form of mathematics. Just a little bit of being able to do your two plus two, two times two, and all those data things. Because you're doing Excel, you're using Power BI, you're using SQL. But when you want to get to the advanced level of data science, you know, you want to start to deal with algorithm, computation. You want to get into writing mach uh, machine learning writing AI, AI software, AI, AI codes, you need to love mathematics. You would need to love mathematics. But for a beginner that wants to just be a data analyst, you don't need to love mathematics. All right, great. Um, I think the last question we'll take for today, last question we'll take today, um, someone is asking that they have some skill in Power BI, XQL, and Excel, but most jobs available require some work experience. So what's the fate of this individual? Yes, most jobs actually require work experience. And that's one of the reasons I usually mention that you should get into what looks like an internship. You know, not to sound marketing, you know, uh, we structure a bit of internship for our students, not a full-time internship, but a remote virtual internship. At least that way you have something to share as experience. So what I would recommend is look around for an opportunity to intern somewhere. And when you intern, then you have a story to put on your CV and you have a story to put on your LinkedIn. And that's pretty much usually the way to get started in any space. Look for something that gives you opportunity to work on multiple projects as an intern. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ita. You've been very helpful. Um, at this point, um, I think we've answered all the questions. We've come to the end of this session. Thank you so much, Mr. Ita, once again for sparing out some time to. Yeah, thank you for having me. To help present. All right, um, uh, it's a pleasure. I will end in this session. Now, we will share the slides with the individuals who registered. And um, hopefully, any other question can be directed to Mr. A. Tayo. All right. Thank you once again. Um, let's enjoy the rest of our day and have a pleasant weekend. Bye bye. Yes. Yes, indeed.